was going to say, as a stroke neurologist, I sometimes feel that when I'm coming onto a cardiology uh, audience, I'm kind of a bad prognostic feature. You know, if, if I'm present, <laughs> things have not gone exactly as planned. So um, the other thing I'd like to say is that I, I was reading an article that after about 20 to 30 seconds of talking, people start to zone out. So I really think 15 minutes is a little bit long to cover all of stroke neurology. I think next year we'll, we'll compress it to 30 seconds. <laughs> so uh, what... What I, I guess I'm going to go over what I think are some important pearls and important points about a, a acute ischemic stroke and then some secondary stroke prevention. You know, we're, we're a little bit uh, behind you all. We don't have a troponin level to check when we suspect that there's acute ischemic stroke. We don't have an EKG for brain ischemia. So we really rely on a diagnosis that's clinical. And then when we look for data, we look for data to either support or refute our hypothesis. And so this is kind of how it goes. This is our definition is that a acute ischemic stroke is an acute persistent focal neurological deficit that is thought to be from ischemia. So that's really where we're stuck. We have to believe that it's from ischemia, and we have to believe that based on risk factors and all kinds of things that go into our evaluation. But keep in mind that mimics are common. And if you look at a population of patients who come into an ER and you ask, how often do you get the diagnosis right when you diagnose stroke? It turns out about one out of six times we don't diagnose stroke when there is a stroke present. And about one out of six times we diagnose stroke when it's not a stroke. So those mimics are, are those you know, not a stroke things. The most common thing is that a patient has an old deficit. They had a previous stroke and that, that deficit gets worse. And it gets worse either because of medical deterioration or the patient has a, a general hypotensive event, syncope, and, and those deficits seem to recur and that's thought to be a new stroke. Of course, there's other neurological symptoms. So a seizure, after a seizure, that's a, usually a focal neurological event as well. And then afterwards, the patient's postictal, that can look just like a stroke. Uh, migraines, vertigo, intoxication, these are things that can cause slurred speech, confusion, ataxia, focal deficits as well. Um, but they're not things that we typically see in patients with um, a lot of vascular risk factors. They're more common in the young patients. So what are the, if we don't have a troponin and if we don't have an EKG, what do we have to go on? Well, it seems that uh, you know, most patients having an acute stroke are going to have a significant elevation in their blood pressure. If you don't see a significant elevation in the blood pressure, you should be thinking that either your patient has a severe cardiomyopathy and can't generate a blood pressure, or maybe it's not a stroke. Um, decreased mental status. Decreased mental status doesn't necessarily mean the patient has to be obtunded, but a person who is completely fully alert is usually not having a stroke. So if you walk in that room, that person's sitting up, has normal saccades, interacting with their family member, that's not a typical presentation of stroke. That patient with a facial droop probably has a Bell's palsy. That patient with vertigo probably has peripheral etiology. So what are some of the markers that it's not a stroke? Uh, we don't typically see excessive emotion or agitation with a stroke. So patients that are um, you know, crying, we don't typically see crying with a stroke. So that's one thing that I always tell folks. Um, pain, you know, certainly you can have a dull pain or dull ache with a, with a stroke uh, if your meninges is irritated from edema, but severe pain or pain at onset, that, that's not common with stroke. It can be in the neck region if you're having a dissection, but even that is usually somewhat delayed. Uh, when it comes to sensory symptoms, a lot of people think of sensory deficits as being, you know, tingling or numbness. and, and what I always like to use with patients is the term Novocaine. Patients know what Novocaine is. So for a stroke, you should really have sensory loss. You shouldn't have positive symptomatology. So positive tingling is not common with stroke. Also, symptoms that are fleeting. If you look at the, the tissue of the brain, if for it to lose blood flow and develop a deficit, that, deficit, that takes about five to 10 minutes. And so a symptom that comes and goes within five minutes and is, is very fleeting is, is your, rarely ischemia. Uh, other things that are uncommon, pallor, incontinence, chest pain, shortness of breath, all these things point to those mimics. Finally, isolated slurred speech. If a patient has slurred speech from a neurological cause, they ought to have other deficits. They ought to have some ataxia. They ought to have some facial droop. They should have some weakness. So isolated slurred speech is usually a sign of an exacerbation of an old deficit or uh, some other metabolic cause. So, Having said all the things that it can't be, this is the kind of the, the next level, the pitfalls. How can you be fooled? Um, 
whenever the blood is flowing, we, we saw a patient this week who had a near, or well, eventually a total occlusion, but a near occlusion of the right middle cerebral artery. When that blood was flowing, she was doing pretty good. When the blood wasn't flowing, she wasn't doing so well. So patients that fluctuate really can be a trap. You can see that patient getting better and think that I don't need to act on this as acute stroke. But in fact, unless the patient says they're 100% resolved and someone who knows them agrees, then that's not a TIA. They have to be 100% resolved. As far as the definition of TIA, you may have been uh, told the old definition, which is that symptoms getting better within 24 hours. But really, a TIA, from a physiological standpoint, has to resolve within an hour. Anything that goes on for longer than an hour should leave some kind of ischemic mark behind if you can do MRI. And typically, is that 10 to 16, 10 to 60 minute range. Then I always like to say, if patients can have ticks and fleas, they can be intoxicated and have a stroke. They can have anxiety and have a stroke. That's a common one. Patients come in and they're having a stroke and they have a mild deficit but for whatever reason, they're anxious and they embellish other deficits and it makes it hard to sort out what's, what's real and what's not. And then of course, they can have old and new symptoms. So how do we go about the, getting the data to either uh, refute or prove that we're dealing with a stroke? So we use CT, I think everybody knows it's to rule out bleed. We're not using it to establish ischemic stroke. There are some early signs of infarct. I don't know that you all have a lecture on, diag on uh, di um, diagnostic imaging this year but uh, the vessels can be hyperdense, the cortex can have gray-white junction blurring, there can, there can be early hypodensity. So some of these features may be there, but those features usually develop over many hours. The MRI is great. It'd be awesome if we could get an MRI in the ER and just know what we're dealing with, but MRIs take about 45 minutes from, even in uh, institutions that are set up for rapid transport, uh, acute stroke protocols, uh, places that have looked at this, they're still looking at 45 minutes to an hour, which is simply too long for acute stroke. So um, we use them really for diagnosing etiology later on. That diffusion weighted or DWI image, if you haven't had a chance to look at that, next time you have a patient who we're evaluating, let us know, we'll look at it with you. But it's basically the marker of acute ischemic stroke. And then flare imaging is those uh, T2 images that are fluid attenuated and that helps us see what else is going on. The sort of the company it keeps. Is this a person with small vessel disease having a new small vessel disease or is this a first of its kind stroke? So then vessel imaging is, a, is an interesting area. Depending on who you ask, I think Dr. Garami would tell you that Doppler is clearly superior to all these other modalities, but uh, the MRI, CT, Doppler, Angio, they all actually have great negative predictive value. So if you order one of these tests and it comes back normal, the chance that you're dealing with a significant stenosis is very low. But, you know, MRIs, patients move, CTAs, we don't always get a good injection, Doppler, you know, we may have a high uh, calcified lesion. So there's a lot of... Uh, lesions that you want to do both two modalities on. And then we've recently done a series looking at the posterior circulation and found that angiogram is far superior to, to differentiating dissections in the posterior circulation versus the anterior circulation. So these are just two examples actually from this week on my service that I thought would be good examples of uh, pitfalls in, in, in imaging. This was a patient who had a very atypical stroke syndrome. He, he'd been on the orthopedic service, and he basically complained that he was having neck pain every time he would walk. But he said, you know, I've had a previous stroke, and this is exactly what it felt like. And if you've had a stroke, you know what it feels like. I still didn't buy his story. I thought it wasn't a stroke. So we did the, the CT, and the CT was read as negative. I was really debating whether or not we should even do MRI in this case, uh, but we did. And so the point here is that this CT is read by your radiologist as negative. Clearly, there's a lot of hypodensity here, but what they're saying is there's no acute stroke. So no acute stroke, but in this patient, the patient had an acute on chronic stroke in this deep tissue. So patients with a lot of chronic ischemia, you're not going to find acute ischemia on a CT, even if it stays out. So a small stroke uh, in a sea of chronic ischemia won't show up. This is another patient, and this, this comes to the point of sharing clinical information with your radiologist. This is a patient who's currently in the, in the CCU, if you all are taking care of her. She's uh, had a right uh, parietal stroke, which is showing up uh, nicely as a hypodensity there. Uh, but the reason clinical information is important is this patient has a severe thrombocytopenia. So if you don't share that information with the radiologist, they may miss that there's a very subtle hyper density in the left parietal region. So a patient who's having an acute stroke, uh, you're going to be thinking about what, what to do and knowing that that patient has a concomitant subarachnoid hemorrhage is important and easily missed. 
So some other uh, diagnostic pearls in terms of our workup for acute stroke, uh, echo is not routinely required in my view in a patient who has a normal EKG. Uh, if there's a reason, sure, do it, but for um, our typical patients, it's not necessary. Uh, Long-term monitoring is something we've really started to look at. So atrial fibrillation, we, the more you look, the more you find it, and we're beginning to look more and more. There's a lot of question about its utility and its cost-effectiveness, but we're certainly shifting towards doing it more in high-risk patients. PFO testing, uh, you know, Dr. Grammy showed a nice alert patient doing a PFO test. I completely agree. Doing a PFO test on a patient in the hospital who's sick, who can't sit up, who can't Valsalva, who has hemiparesis makes no sense to me. Uh, more or less, I'm not doing PFO tests in the hospital setting. And then finally, we, we try and we sometimes think that soft neurological signs aren't that important, and they're not these sort of hard focal deficits. But if you're dealing with a patient with a near occlusion or a carotid, knowing that they have mood, memory, dizziness, excessive fatigue, those are relevant to making decisions. So let me get to the acute management, and then we'll speak briefly about secondary management. Uh, we're talking about TPA as our, our mainstay of, of acute management. For many years, as of February this year, we've got a second option. So, uh, you know, page stroke team, we don't expect any of you all to be giving TPA. But what you can do to help us is get a stat CT, get a blood glucose, think about any medications that may interfere with TPA administration, especially anticoagulants. And then we go by last known well. So we don't want to know when it was noticed. We want to know when the person was normal beforehand. Uh, we use a four and a half hour window. Uh, what I was alluding to earlier is that now we have clot retrieval. Clot retrieval was established by four randomized trials this year, and it is uh, certainly superior uh, to TPA for patients who have large vessel occlusion. And um, hopefully everyone's familiar with the, uh, the protocols for getting those patients to angio. So I'm going to do a little bit on secondary medical management. The nice thing is that this overlaps considerably with what you all do for ischemic heart disease. And for the purpose of this, I'm just going to cover atherosclerotic or cardiac sources of stroke. You know, hypertension is something that, that I don't need to lecture you all about. You know about hypertension. But if you look at all the organs that are affected by hypertension, no organ bears more ischemia than the brain. And so really targeting a 120 over 80 is our goal. When we, when we do that in our clinic, we add agents. We don't necessarily just maximize and keep maximizing. It, we found that adding agents is the way to go. The best agents are the ones that you already know. We use somewhat less beta blockers than you all do simply because we don't get as good a blood pressure control, and we use far less alpha blockers. So if a patient runs a systolic blood pressure in the 160s and you can get them down to normal from a stroke standpoint, you've, decle you've decreased their relative risk of stroke by 50%. If you take that patient and you control all their risk factors and they're high risk, a person who's high risk means they have about an 8 to 20% recurrent risk of stroke. If you do your part with medical management, you decrease that to 2 to 3%. Statins, statins are, are very important for our management of stroke. I've asked our residents now when they present a patient to tell me not only as a patient AFib not on anticoagulation, I want to hear if a person has hyperlipidemia not on statin therapy. The Sparkle and Jupiter uh, trials have shown a 20 and 48% relative risk reduction in stroke. It's not about the numbers, it's about the risk. We use mostly atorvastatin and rosuvastatin. If the myalgias interfere with the patient's activities of daily living, then I recommend decreasing dose frequency. I've used every other day a lot. I've used weekly occasionally. Antiplatelet therapy, this is where everybody talks about. This is when something goes wrong, somebody wants to add another platelet drug. It's actually the least effective thing that we do for stroke prevention, uh, about 12 to 20 percent relative risk reduction. The, pro, the pros of aspirin is that it's a predictable metabolism. It doesn't require prescription, and it wears off in 24 hours. However, it can cause GI upset. It's marginally, marginally less effective than clopidogrel. Clopidogrel is now affordable. It doesn't cause GI upset in most patients. It may have slightly better efficacy. However, metabolism varies among patients, and it takes about seven to 10 days to wear off, and of course, they have to keep up with their prescription. Uh, other considerations which we sometimes use are silostazole, aspirin, and diprimidol, which is marketed as Agronox. The newer treatments, the, the ones that you all are using in the heart, we've not proven in stroke, but we may eventually, but right now we're not using them for stroke prevention. Dual therapy is something you always have to weigh. It does seem to help patients in the short term, short term being weeks to months. Uh, in the long term, we sometimes use it if a patient has a low bleeding risk and a high ischemic risk. So finally, I'm just going to say a little bit about anticoagulation. Everybody knows we use it in AFib. It's probably beneficial in low EF, but worse if it was underpowered. Other conditions, arterial hypercoagulability, cerebral venous thrombosis, and dissection. 
choice of anticoagulant, you could start a fight with this. Uh, but basically, uh, the NOACs seem to have a class effect of decreasing intracranial hemorrhage, and therefore, as neurologists, we like them. Uh, for non-AFib, we balance many factors and typically go with the older drugs. And just a quick advertisement for medical management, we are enrolling in the CREST-2 trial, which is an aggressive medical management versus endarterectomy and stenting, two different trials or two parallel trials. This is for asymptomatic carotid stenosis, 70 to 90%, 2% annual risk of stroke, but our surgical series come mostly from the pre-statin era. So if you see those patients, think of us. Thank you all.